church, so good to have you with us. Come on, we're gonna do some awesome worship together. We're gonna lift up the name of Jesus. We're gonna see darkness fall. Come on, are you ready? Wherever you're at, sing aloud. Rise, my soul.
There's no name above the name of Jesus. There's no sickness above the name of Jesus. There's no issue above the name of Jesus. We declare your name, Lord. We declare your goodness, God. I love so much the lyrics to that song, I will praise you in the promise and the pain. It reminds me so much that God is with us and for us in every season, in every emotion and every day of our lives. And right now we're gonna take some time to pray for the needs in our church, the needs of our family, our friends, and the needs of our world. Um, but before we do, I wanna share some amazing praise reports with you. We have someone here who is thanking God that their dad was healed from a severe case of COVID after being in hospital for 36 days. And that is phenomenal. Um, we have someone else saying that their mom's cancer treatment, the side effects are doing better. And I wanna share one more with you. Thanking God for a part-time job for my husband. It's such a hard season for everyone, but I wanna remind you so much that our God is with and for you. And I wanna share Psalms 118 verse five with you. It says, out of my deep anguish and pain, I prayed and God, you helped me as a father. You came to my rescue and you broke open the way into a beautiful and broad place. And sometimes in our hard seasons, we can't see towards that beautiful and broad place. But I wanna remind you that God is there and He is working with you and for you towards that beautiful and broad place. So Father, right now we lift up every single need in our church, in our world, Lord. And we pray that you would have your way, God. And where we're lacking the faith, Lord, and where we're feeling doubt, that you would come forward, Lord, that you would support us and that you would show us that you are yes. there, you are for us and you love us. And Lord, right now we pray for healing from COVID. COVID-19, Lord, we thank You that You were in the midst of it, Lord. We thank You so much that You are healing those who are full of fear and full of anxiety, Lord. You are the ultimate comforter and You are right there. And God, we also pray for those who are finding this season incredibly difficult on their finances, Lord. We pray for provision, we pray for guidance, and we pray for wisdom. And Lord, we just love You. We pray that today You would speak to us, You would work through us, and that You would remind us we are not alone in this season. We are never alone in these seasons, Lord. In Jesus' Name, Amen. 
Well, welcome to church today. We're so glad you're joining with us, no matter where you're watching from. Welcome home. And I want to encourage you to get connected if you haven't already. If ever there was a time to get connected and stay connected, it's now. We need each other. And you know what? Connect groups are how we do that. If you aren't a part of a connect group, but want to be, I wanna encourage you to text the number on the screen. And one of our team would love to follow up with you and help make that happen. Connect groups are amazing, get in on it. Um, But hey, right now, church, I wanna encourage us in our giving. I love what it says in Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. If we do not give up, keep giving. It's good for you, it's good for the church, and it's good for our world. Uh, I love the opportunity that we get to build God's house. We get to partner with Him. And so let's trust Him with it today. And as you're preparing, I wanna encourage you, you can text to give using the number on the screen or use the Hillsong USA app to give. But let me pray for us as we give here today. God, thank you so much that we get to build your kingdom, Mm -hmm. that we get to see your kingdom advance on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that you would use our giving to bless the world, bless those around us. God, we're so grateful and I pray that as we give, that we would see your blessing come back to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.
let's just ask the Lord to have his way in our nation, in the world. Oh, good news in grace in the poor, comfort for all those who mourn, for the broken heart. We'll sing for them tonight. Sing louder, release from prison and shame, oppression turning to praise for every Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's such an honor to have you with us, whether you are watching alone or with friends and family or in a connect group viewing party or watching from a coffee shop or maybe even unfortunately watching from a hospital room. We may each be viewing from a lot of different contexts, but we're all connecting together in this same space at this very moment to gather around God's word together as a community. Now, I wanna jump right in today, and then I'm going to leave enough time at the end of this message for a brief interview with Maria Hansen Quine. Maria is a part of Hillsong Phoenix, and she's also a school counselor who specializes in diversity training. Maria and her husband, Sam, have nine children, seven of which are adopted. And their beautiful family looks like a United Colors of Benetton ad. Boy, that dates me, doesn't it? 
Maria's actually written a couple of children's books on diversity and anti-racism, and I think our conversation will be helpful, especially in light of this message and our continuing cry for racial justice in our communities. So grab your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter one. We are continuing on with our summer sermon series called A Letter from Lockdown. And as you can see, I'm about 10 days into a lockdown beard and it's driving me stark raving mad. In fact, I feel like I need to take an informal poll. If you think I should continue with the effort, can I get a thumbs up in the chat line? If you think I need to abandon this thing immediately that is hopeless, give me a thumbs down. I'm actually a little intimidated because some of the guys in our church have a strong beard game. Thinking of Brandon Sampy, thinking of Nate Wolf, Ty Braylon, even my own son, Terry the Third, has a red beard like a Viking, and I'm doing everything I can to generate a little peach fuzz in Jesus' name. Hey, today I wanna to talk to you about citizens of heaven and the good news of Jesus. And I wanna begin where we left off last time in Philippians 1, beginning with verse 12. Here's what Paul says. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Now, dropping down to verse 27, above all, if you're comfortable circling that in your Bible, then why don't you do that? Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ Jesus, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Those lines could be taken from the newsfeed this morning. We are in this struggle together. Now, before we unpack what that means for each of us, let me tell you a quick story that will help you to understand what we've just read. It's a period piece. Do you like them? Judith and I do. And I think over the past year or so, we've watched almost every historical drama, every period piece on Netflix that's worth watching. Well, this period piece is set in 42 BC. It was two years after the assassination of Julius Caesar. The co-conspirators in his murder, Cassius and Brutus, have been out in the eastern parts of the Roman Empire and they've amassed an army of about 100,000 soldiers. Now, meanwhile, Caesar's successors, Mark Antony and Octavian, well, they've assembled another army of about 100,000 to seek revenge. Those two armies collide out in the plain just to the west of Philippi. Now, a key tactic in Roman conflict was something called a shield wall. Each soldier carried a large shield and they stood side by side and row by row. They had their shields in front and also others held them above. This made an army something like a human tank rolling slowly across a battlefield. It was devastatingly effective. Now, the battle at Philippi was especially devastating as Roman fought against Roman. Finally, Mark Antony and Octavian won, but about 40,000 men were killed in the conflict and the memory of that battle would forever be imprinted upon the city of Philippi. Now, following the battle, Octavian declared Philippi to be Roman soil. So if you were in Philippi, it was as if you were in Rome itself. This was the place where the enemies of Caesar had been defeated. This was the place where the future of the empire had been secured. 
This was the place where old Roman veteran soldiers came to retire. This place, Philippi. Well, it was as patriotic and nationalistic as the most loyal and devoted citizens of any nation have ever been at any point in history. And that's why Paul chooses to write some provocative words to them about what it means to be a citizen of heaven living on earth. Now, at first glance, the language may not seem so provocative because we're reading it from a different time and place. But to them, it was loaded. In verse 27, Paul writes, above all, that's the Greek word monos, which means only. In other words, what he's saying is that on this ancient battlefield, built on Roman power and pride, you must only live as citizens of heaven. And then this whole idea of citizenship comes back at the end of chapter 3 and verse 20, where Paul says, but we are citizens of heaven. So why then was citizenship so important? Well, if you lived back then and you believed the propaganda of the day, then you knew that Rome claimed to have discovered the ways of peace and prosperity and justice and was committed to spreading Roman peace across the planet just as we might want to spread democracy and human rights all over the world today, right? So as a citizen of Rome, what you would have really wanted in life was not necessarily to go live in Rome. You would have wanted to take Rome to Philippi or Ephesus or Colossae. You would have wanted to take Roman values and cultures everywhere. Your mission was to proclaim the gospel of the Roman Empire. You wanted people to know that if they trusted in Caesar as Lord and Savior, they could experience the peace and prosperity that he offered to all who trusted in him. So maybe now you can see why this language would have been so provocative in Philippi. And that's why Paul is using it to make a much greater point. What he's really saying is that as Christians, followers of Jesus, our primary identity is not our earthly citizenship. Our primary identity is our heavenly citizenship. We are in the world, but not of the world. And our purpose in the world as citizens of heaven is to extend the beauty of heaven, the life of heaven, and the culture of heaven everywhere we go. We are called to take heaven to the places we live, work, shop, eat and play. Now, I think this is more relevant than ever because we're living in a deeply divided world in which everything around us has become politicized. And all of us are having to make some really important decisions at this moment in history about who or what is going to rule our lives and how we are going to define ourselves. Are we going to be citizens of heaven first? and citizens of our earthly community second? Or are we going to prioritize our earthly citizenship above our heavenly citizenship? Now, Paul is clear on the fact that he was grateful to be a Roman citizen. In Acts 22, he makes that clear. There's nothing wrong with being grateful for your earthly citizenship. In fact, just a few months ago, my beautiful South African daughter-in-law, Gerda, became a U.S. citizen and we all got a little emotional at her swearing-in ceremony. I love America and I'm so grateful for our country. But as much as I love the land of my natural birth, even more, I love the place of my spiritual birth. I love my country, but the kingdom of God is my above all priority, my monos priority, my ultimate priority. Hey, what about you? Are you willing to prioritize what it means to be a Christian above what it means to be an American or Canadian or Australian or Mexican or South African? Are you willing to put your heavenly citizenship above your earthly citizenship? On the other hand, if you choose to put your earthly citizenship above your heavenly citizenship, what is the subsequent impact of that? What does that mean for your gospel witness in the world? 
What does that mean for the church, the global church in our generation? What will the church look like a generation down the road if we allow things like nationalism and individualism to redefine who we are as the people of God in this age? Now, I know those are some heavy questions, but I think we have to ask them and we have to answer them with such clarity that we not only inform our communities about where our above only allegiance lies, but we also declare who we are as the people of God and what we stand for to the principalities and powers of this age. In fact, in a recent poll, 820 evangelical Christians were asked the question, are you an American first or a Christian first? And did you know that 48% of them said, I'm an American first? 42% of them said, I'm a Christian first, and the rest said, I don't know. And I think there may be many other cultures around the world that would feel the same way about their own national identity. But being a follower of Jesus doesn't allow us that option. We are called to be citizens of His kingdom above all, above everything else. In Revelation 3 and verse 12, Jesus said, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Hey, I love that. Our citizenship is in heaven, but it doesn't stay in heaven. It comes down from heaven to influence the city of man by transforming the heart of humanity and by informing us all on how to be better citizens in the soil of our planting. Heaven isn't something we wait for. It is what we are tasked with bringing to a broken world here and now. That's why in Matthew 6 and verse 10, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything in our lives, from our prayers to our actions, should be focused on bringing that which exists in heavenly realms down into places and spaces. As in heaven, so in Scottsdale. As in heaven, so in Mesa as in heaven, so in Gilbert, Phoenix, Glendale, Las Vegas, Summerlin, Oro Valley, and Tucson, as in heaven, so in Saudi Arabia and Iran, as in heaven, so in China and Venezuela, as in heaven, so on earth. Hey, what if we devoted our lives to that mission? What if we devoted our lives to discovering what exists in heaven and then giving expression to that in the world around us? How different could the world be? That's exactly what Paul saw in Philippi. He saw people who had their citizenship in earthly kingdoms, but put their faith in Jesus. Therefore, their citizenship transferred from earthly realms to a heavenly realm, from a material realm to a spiritual realm, from a temporal realm to an eternal realm. And collectively, they became a new society, a holy nation, the church. Let me talk about who was in the church. There was Lydia. She was a wealthy, successful fashion designer businesswoman from Thyatira, which probably meant she was Asian. There was a former fortune telling slave girl who possessed nothing in this world. And then there was a Roman jailer who would have lived a privileged life. Those were the first three decisions for Jesus in Philippi. And I think they represent the community at large. For that matter, they may even represent our community. A wealthy immigrant, an impoverished former slave, and a privileged Roman. Those three people would have never been in community together before. They became a part of this new community. They would have never been in community apart from this new community. But it was because of a common citizenship in the kingdom of God that they found themselves together in this new society, this kingdom community. 
And this first century phenomenon, well, it wasn't just happening in Philippi. It was happening in Rome, where Paul was writing from. That's why in Romans 2.11, he said, for God does not show favoritism. It was happening out in Galatia, where Paul wrote to them and said, there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28. It was happening in Colossae, where Paul wrote, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or civilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Colossians 3.11. It was happening in all of those places in the first century world, just as it is happening at Hillsong Church all over the world today. As we embrace our heavenly citizenship more than our earthly citizenship, we are becoming a beautiful, diverse community made up of people from every tribe and tongue united under the banner of the name of Jesus. Now, before I close, let me bring this down to where we are in this moment. Back to verse 27. When Paul writes, above all, manos, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ, Eugene Peterson translates it this way in the message. Live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Now, let me be clear about one thing. Living worthy of the gospel doesn't mean that we are deserving of the gospel or that we have earned the gospel in any way. We receive the gospel because of grace. We believe the gospel because of faith. For Paul, the idea of living worthy is about ascribing worth and value. In other words, we should live in such a way that our very actions show the good news of Jesus is worthy of our lives. We should live better lives because we have believed a better gospel. Did you get that? Come on, somebody. We should live better lives because we have believed a better gospel. I want you to write that down. We should live better lives because we have believed a better gospel. In other words, the gospel is about love. Therefore, we should be known as a loving people. The gospel is about peace. Therefore, we should wage peace in the midst of conflict. The gospel is about the abundant life. Therefore, our daily lives and our earthly relationships should be filled with life and joy. The gospel is about justice. Therefore, we should be a justice-seeking people. The gospel is about liberty. Therefore, we shouldn't live as stuffy legalists, but we should live free. Yes, free indeed. The gospel is about humility. Therefore, we should be a humble people, gladly serving others. Our lives should be shaped along the lines of the gospel. The gospel should inform our behavior and ultimately it should influence the world around us through us. Our citizenship in heaven should influence our citizenship on earth. Did you know that citizenship is always about balancing individual rights with community responsibilities? That's why Paul tells us, back to verse 27, when you live as citizens of heaven, worthy of the good news, then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. In other words, our citizenship is not just for our own benefit. It's also to stand together with one spirit and one purpose and for fighting together for the good news. That's exactly what we're doing in this season. As we stand with those in our community who have suffered through systemic racism, injustice, inequality, and inequity. Paul said in another place, when one hurts, we all, suffer and weep and mourn along with them. And we're fighting together to keep our faith strong in the good news of Jesus. Listen, church, we need better laws to protect all lives from the womb to the tomb. 
We need better laws and policies to protect black lives in their vulnerability. And we should all work together to bring about change and reform. But as we do, let our work here on earth in our secondary citizenship be informed by our primary citizenship, which is in heaven. Heaven has the answers that we so desperately need for the divisions that we see all around us. That's why Paul rolls right out of this into chapter two with these words. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in his spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. We have believed a better gospel, therefore we can live better lives. Now, at the first century, there were many writings of the day that reflected upon the culture of the church. And these don't rise to the level of scripture, but they do help to inform our view as to the culture and community of these called out citizens of heaven. One of those writings is called the Epistle of Matthias to Dignatus. And he wrote concerning the church, inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them was determined and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners, as citizens, they share in all things with all others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their own native country and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Wow. I love that picture of what the church is called to be. Citizens of heaven, living out our days responsibly on earth. Hey, in closing today, have you become a part of heaven's citizenship? In John chapter three, an educated and influential man came to Jesus and said to him, good teacher, I've been watching you and it's clear that you know something about how to connect with God that I don't know. What do I have to do to connect with him? And Jesus said to him, you have to be born again by believing in him. Just as your natural birth gave you an earthly citizenship in this world, your spiritual birth will give you citizenship in the heavenly world. I know that you have a natural citizenship. The question I'm asking is, do you have a spiritual citizenship? Is your citizenship in heaven? If not, I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm asking you to step into a life transforming relationship with Jesus and to become a part of the kingdom of heaven. It's as simple as believing. I'd love to lead you in that simple prayer, making Jesus the savior and Lord of your life. This is a prayer transferring your citizenship. Would you pray it with me? Bow your head and close your eyes and say, dear heavenly father, I want my citizenship to be in heaven. I believe Jesus is your son. And so I receive him as savior and Lord. I am now a child of God. My future is secure. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. If you prayed that prayer, I am applauding for you, along with people who are applauding in homes and living room and connect groups across the region and across the planet. That's the best decision you could ever make. And Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Would you click the button that says, I've raised my hand or put a high five or hand wave right there in the chat line. That way we can celebrate this along with you. God bless you. Your life will never be the same.
And now before we're through here today, I want to turn to a conversation for the next few minutes with Maria Hansen Quine. She and her husband, Sam, are a part of our Hillsong Church family. Uh, she is a school counselor. She's written a fantastic new book out on teaching diversity to children. And I told you how many children that she and Sam have together, nine, two biologically, seven adopted. But what I didn't tell everyone is their backgrounds. Yes. So I know the picture is coming up on the screen, yes. but can you tell us what the racial composition looks like, the ethnic composition? position, the nationalities. We have two biological kids, so those two jewels or kids, they're biracial because my husband is Asian, so they're Caucasian, Asian, and my husband is also born in South Korea. Okay. And then we have four kids adopted from China, so they're also Asian, that would be their race, right? And then we have two kids from Ghana, which is a part of West Africa, and then we have a daughter that we adopted from the United States who is biracial, black, and Native American. Amazing. I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> Do you guys ever get mistaken for Brad and Angelina? <laughs> that has it, been said. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm late to that joke. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's beautiful to see your family. It's this Thank beautiful uh, tapestry. It, early in the message, I call it a Benetton ad, which <laughs> only dates me from back in the day. But there were yeah. those beautiful pictures of these diverse families. Yes. And theirs were always carefully constructed for the photo op. Yes. You're living in the reality yes. of it. Your family is the real day in and day out. Yeah. That's amazing. So going back to your earliest memory, yeah. can you recall when a passion for diversity was formed within you? Was there some moment that you can go back to or did it just kind of evolve through life? You know what, I think in thinking about this topic and reflecting, reflecting on it, I feel like it started when I was a little girl. Okay. And I grew up in the Faroe Islands, which is a little, little, little tiny country. It will not even make it on some maps. Okay. Honestly, I remember maybe seeing two non-white kids my entire, wow. yeah, my entire growing up and in the years, and they were adopted and they were Asian. My parents on one of their trips bought me a brown doll. And that doll, to, to me, I thought she was beautiful. I mean, it's such a simple act, but I feel like my passion for diversity goes back to that moment because I grew up in a predominantly white culture. But really from that doll, I feel like that kind of birthed in me this, this value and esteem of different colors. And then as I grew, you know, came later into uh, adulthood, had some other experiences that just kind of birthed that even more. It's amazing how God leaves a breadcrumb mm -hmm. trail in mm -hmm. our lives and that even some things that we feel like just dropped into our lives yeah. just happened, we just became this. Yes. I think more often than not, if you look back, you'll see that there were early indicators yes. and subtle and not so subtle signs that yes. just kind of set us up yeah. uh, for the call of God. But we have to pursue that. We've for got to sure. follow that for sure. when we become aware of that. And of course you did. Uh, you went and got your undergraduate in psychology. Yeah. And then from there you got your master's yes. in social work, yes. correct? Yeah. And you got your master's in New Jersey. I did. Talk about that for a moment. New Jersey is one of the most diverse states in the nation. Right. And so to be learning there in that environment, I had best friends that were black, learning from them, listening to their stories and their experiences, taking courses on diversity. I loved it. Why spend your life or invest your life into helping children understand diversity? Is there a sense that if you can get to kids while they're young and impressionable, that perhaps we can see yeah. a different outcome as they grow in life? Yeah, well, they are the future, right? I mean, children are the future and I really believe that. And I really believe that we can inspire and influence them, right, in those years. But if you look at research too, they actually say that a child's racial identity is pretty much crystallized by the time they're nine. The other thing too, kind of with this, is if, if we don't teach them, they're gonna make up their own mind. 
right? They're gonna make up their own opinions. And then they're gonna, that's gonna come from other influences. So it's gonna come from the TV shows that they watch. It's gonna come from the books that they read. And it's gonna come from whatever peers might say or a teacher might say. We need to teach them, right, the beauty of diversity, one that it exists. Well, speaking of books, you've written a couple of books, one of which was just published. Yes. And I ordered a copy. I've got my own copy. <laughs> I see awesome. you brought a copy today, That's but awesome. I got mine from Amazon, <laughs> and I'm awesome. going to ask you to sign it for my granddaughter. <laughs> uh, what led you to write the book? With everything that has happened in the last few months within our country, I think the realization that really hit for me is I thought that things were getting better and it's just this realization that it didn't. You know, the way that God works with me is that He will kind of plant a seed for a few years later, right? He'll plant an idea. Right. And He did that a few years back and I just never thought, me, write a book. <laughs> and then I just heard Him say it was time. And honestly, like the story itself, He downloaded in about a day. I, I mean, it was just kind of came and I wrote it. My biggest feeling during everything that had happened this year is, honestly like sad just really sad that we are still where we are right. it was a conversation with god just saying okay this 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 is what i want you to do and i just said okay you did it you did, it. You did a fantastic <laughs> job and your daughter ella i know uh, illustrated the book which is a really cool story too because she also she's adopted from ghana and we brought her home so when i first met her she did not even think she could color oh wow the fact that then god would use that right which which was her like greatest weakness someone might say right to, i mean I, her pictures are awesome they're fantastic <laughs> they are so, very distinct yes. that's a signature style yes. and uh, i think she's going to do really well in life well maria i want to thank you so much for writing this book mm -hmm. uh, i'm really excited to read it to my granddaughter okay. and i know it's going to be a blessing to many people and i would encourage you to order a copy for yourself it's called be different and be kind a story about diversity by maria hansen quine and i know you've got another book coming yes. out on being anti-racist yes. so i'm hopeful that we can actually have another conversation Absolutely. about that because we all know that we're on a journey together and this journey means a lot of conversation conversations along the way as we are in the pursuit of God's dream for justice, equality, equity, and fairness in our communities. And so with that, pick up your copy of this on amazon.com this week. Hey, we never like to end a service without gathering around a moment of communion. And so I'd like you to take whatever you have prepared for this moment here today. I'm still using these little pre-packaged communion containers that we have right here at the church that we'll all use again before very long when we gather on site. But you take whatever you have there, maybe a piece of toast and a cup of coffee. Jesus said, as often as you take and eat the bread and drink the cup, you do so in remembrance of me. And so today, in remembrance of this beautiful Savior who loved us and then brought us into his diverse family, we take and eat in remembrance of him. And now we drink what symbolizes his blood shed for us. With that today, church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Jesus' name. Have an awesome week. Can't wait to see you again next weekend right here for Online Church. Thank you.